everybody, uh, the American and Leeds podcast, Thursday night podcast with me tonight is Jeer Lynch. I, Jeer Lynch, on Twitter. Um, if you don't know him, Leeds United, The View, he does daily uh, content uh, for Leeds United. And actually, I appreciate, uh, Jeer, I'm going to wax lyrical for about you for a second here. I just appreciate what you do because I understand this. You're not just going on Twitter scanning Twitter and then coming back and saying, here's three or four things that I've, <laughs> I've found. Mm-hmm. You do a lot of homework. I understand the hours of work that go into um, your, your content. Um, and so it's well-researched, well-curated uh, content for Leeds United fans. So uh, just big thank you from me. Um, a big admirer of what you're doing and, and um, continued the success uh over there on the view appreciate it mate. thanks how are how's the wife how are the dogs how's everything going everything's going fine everything's pretty yeah. quiet uh my better half is currently in galway doing them uh, doing a gig she's a comedy gig over there because she's a stand-up right. comedian so she's doing that over in the west of ireland and um, one of my dogs is uh, passed out asleep here and the other one is um in her other home with my um <laughs> with my, my previous partner so yeah she's um over there for a while so okay. um yeah quiet house tonight quiet house well that's a good thing um look we just had a friendly against manchester united what what are your thoughts i think the first thing is to probably temper expectations that people have with this friendly it's it's a friendly it's a first preseason game the bulk of the squad have only really had um, a week's worth of kind of preseason training under the new manager then you've got the players that came back on Monday who kind of really only went in and did their testing and then were on a plane out to Norway. So mm-hmm. I think from that perspective, it's, it's a Manchester United side that had a bit of quality in the first half, but a lot of kids and a lot of players that probably won't ever really make the breakthrough into the Manchester United side. A couple of players that actually played non-league last year in the National League, were on loan mm-hmm. in the National League. So um, Leeds, pretty young side as well. And, and, and without pretty much a recognised centre midfield, I thought just short version of this I thought some of the young players really stood out and looked really good I think there's some promising things there and I think some of the older players maybe let themselves down a little bit and, and, and might have carried on the form from the end of last season which also was kind of understandable considering they haven't had a whole lot of training with the new manager so but same mistakes made that were made last season from the older yeah. players and um, Cooper was fine but ailing and ailing for the second goal and stroke for the first goal I thought that didn't 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 shine shot themselves in any kind of great light um, and then some very good young performances. I thought Archie Gray and, and Lewis Bate for a period in the second half actually looked quite good. There's definitely a need for experience in there with them to, to allow them right. to be more. I thought Dan James was fine out on the wing. Um, not a huge amount of players in the box when he did get it for his deliveries and they, they weren't great, but I, I thought he showed enough. Darko JB looks fine in the middle of the park as well. I thought, I thought um, Chris Moore and um, Jeremiah Mullen actually looked quite good in either mm. half and centre-back as well. So some good things there. Cody did fine on the right-hand side. Uh, struggled a bit on the left-hand side, but he's not a left-sided right. player. So, But yeah, look, there's some some good stuff there. Some areas that Leeds really need to to look at, at, at plug and holes to, to sort it out for next season. Hmm. Well, one of those old players, older players, players that have been in the squad for a while, is Patrick Bamford. Oh. Dear. You're a nine. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've been a nine. Okay. And how do you evaluate? You obviously are uh, your coach as well. How do you evaluate Patrick Bamford right now? Let's just say the past few months. And, and w- what would be your ideal plans for that position in from what you understand Fark's system, Farka's system? Yeah, I think... Pat's a tricky one because mm-hmm. with everything that happened last season, the personal attacks that he had to deal with as well, that's going to leave a mark on him. And it, and it clearly has. The amount of injuries he's had over the last two years, there's there's definitely a a knock-on longer-term effect on that. He doesn't seem to be as quick off the mark as he was. But then again, not fully fit either coming into the season. He's still recovering from an injury he got the, towards the back end of the season as well. So they've taken their toll on him. And they can do that, and we've seen that with other players as well. I, I didn't think he did enough in the game. Uh, I mm-hmm. saw him complaining again to the younger players, which which 
I just think needs to stop. I'm being honest about it. It doesn't, it's not helping anybody. It's not, it's not progressing the younger players. Now they could turn around and say that they've got a fantastic relationship and I'm off the pitch. And I could, I could be very wrong in, in my judgment on this, but mm-hmm. I think, you know, I think it was Chris Moore maybe in the second half, played a ball into him and didn't quite make it. And there was lots of arm waving and shouting back from the front line. It was like, Pat wasn't doing a whole lot of work up to that point. I think the first 10 minutes of the second half, we saw a high press for the first time since probably since Jesse left or different type of press from Jesse, but more similar to what mm-hmm. Marcelo did with the press. And that was great to see in the first couple of minutes of the second half. And Pat was involved in that. And that's what he does very well. He will press. Mm-hmm. Hold up play wasn't great, which is supposed to be his, his main attribute was his hold up play. It wasn't great. Ball wasn't sticking. And then when you do look at him getting, a one, getting the one chance that he did get, yes, he was offside, but he didn't realize he was offside. And then the ball is on his right foot again, and it's an empty net, and, he, and it, the ball doesn't make it into the goal. It's stopped in the line, and then the flag goes up for offside, but the flag went up after the ball was stopped. Mm-hmm. So the finishing is still a little rusty, and I think if Leeds want to progress, I don't, I'm not 100% sure if Pat Bamford is the, is the Daniel Farke type striker, Timmy mm-hmm. Pookie is slightly different. Although Pookie can drop in to get a touch and then run in behind. Pat does that to a degree. But I I think you see Pookie in the box an awful lot more than we currently see Pat Bamford in the box. And he was a lot more mobile. Um, not necessarily faster or anything like that, but he moves an awful lot more off the ball, create space for himself. So I think Pat's got a bit of work to do. The issue will be whether Leeds can get a number nine that can score goals in the championship because... They do need an experienced number nine in there. We've been looking for it for a while. From looking at Jorginho Rutter in the game, mm-hmm. in the first half, I, I don't see a number nine in Jorginho Rutter. I do see a very exciting wide player, or 10 with Rutter, but I don't mm-hmm. know. He's not aggressive enough for me, pressing players from behind and, and trying to nick balls. There was a couple of chances in the first half where he could have a bit more pressure on the centre-back and he may have stolen the ball and, and been in to score. So... I think we need a out and out number nine with experience that will allow the likes of Joffrey, the likes of Sonny Perkins, the likes of Mateo Joseph to come through slowly mm. um, off the bench. But it's it's a it's it's a p- potentially a problem position. The other side to it as well is if you can get Paddy fit and he does recapture some of the form, you could have a 15, 16, 17 goal season next year. But it's a lot of water has gone under the bridge with Pat. And I think from his perspective and from Leeds' perspective, I think there's possibly a, a line in the sand moment coming where a parting away is probably needs to happen for both for both sides for a fresh start. Hmm. Well, let's talk about another player that just I think at an interesting point of, of his development uh, came in with a lot of fanfare. Ha, had a loan uh, that didn't really work out last year, but Joffe, hmm. what what do you do about Joffe? He he doesn't seem like an out and out number nine was maybe marketed as a striker coming up in the youth academy. Mm. Um, is he a 10? What would you do with, with Joffrey? Would you loan him out again? I think there's a possibility of that happening all right, yeah, depending on what Leeds can bring in and if they can bring in something up front. Um, I like Joffrey. I like a lot of his attributes. I like his physicalness. I, I When he's on the ball in tight areas, he's very good. There's an argument to say he just needs a run of games. He just needs to be given the chance and put into the team. And I, and I hate the term, give him a chance, but it's it's not the same as looking at an under 21 player and saying, let's give the under 21 player a chance. You know, it's, it's slightly mm-hmm. different to that. Um, but I think his back end of his, his loan spell at Sunderland was better than the start of it. Definitely. But the managers there said the same thing that we've seen. He's probably better in a two than he is in a one. The issue he has is Leeds won't play with a two. Farker doesn't play with a two. So what do you do there? Mm-hmm. So there's, it's, it's a strange one. I don't think he'd be first choice. I think there's a lot of competition there. I think Matteo Joseph looks quite dangerous, even from wide areas. I thought he looked pretty good yesterday. So there's a lot of competition in that area. I'd love to see Joffy make it and break through. I don't know if he will, um, but I still think he'll probably go on and play in the championship anyway. But um, it's a it's an important preseason for him. Not only him, Sam Greenwood is in the same bracket as him. The two of them really need to to step on this season and really break through, or else all of the work and the development was was, was kind of a waste to a degree at Leeds anyway, because they're going to go off to other clubs and play there. They, they just they need to do it a bit more off the ball for me. They need to look more um, interested in getting on the ball. They need to, not that they're not interested, but just, you know, from looking at a game, you can see a player mm-hmm. standing around an awful lot. I think they need to be far more active and far more mobile, moving off the ball and, and training space for themselves to get on it. Um, and if they do that, they could be they could be fine for us. They could be really, two really good players for us. But I think if they don't do that, this is probably the last season you're going to see them there because they're, mm-hmm. they're not in the younger bracket anymore. There's no younger mm-hmm. players pushing through. So, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one for Joffy. I think. Give him preseason, let him, let let Frack have a good look at him. Maybe mm-hmm. 
more time and more games and see if he can if he can it can get a run at it and then maybe maybe he's the answer that we're looking for but I don't I don't know some of the uh I guess Twitter headlines or the, maybe the headlines this today or the chat was yeah. about the gaffers comments after the yeah. match talking about the loans, not receiving money, not wanting to be in this position again. Mm. Uh, Pope really kind of was able to lift the veil a little bit about what's going on, maybe maybe behind the scenes. Um, do you think, well, what did you think of the comments? Um, and we'll just start there. What did you think of, the, uh, of Farkas comments uh, after the match? I think I've got a very clear understanding of who he is as a coach. I didn't I didn't spend a huge amount of time ever looking at his press conferences when he was at Norwich, obviously mm-hmm. for obvious reasons. But um I think the way it was described was didn't pull any punches. I think it was very direct, very straight up with the fans, which I think the fans would appreciate, especially when there's not a huge amount of information coming out of the club. So right. I think people would appreciate that. I was a little concerned, if I'm being very honest, uh, when I heard mm-hmm. the comments because I thought he doesn't sound like a man to me who's expecting incomings anytime soon. Yeah, but at the same time, I think the way business has been done at Leeds, I I'm not expecting to hear a huge amount before signing is actually finalised and done. Um, the other piece of fracky as well, there could just be a possibility of I'm just you know pulling the, the the company line like we saw Jesse do last year, whereas I'm not talking about transfers. You know, I'm just not doing it. Mm. And I don't know how he feels about that kind of stuff. A lot of managers get frustrated with that, and some managers like it. They like leaning into it and talking about it. Other managers, you can, you can see there's a frustration with them with it. So. For me, I think I still give it a couple of days to see if if anything pans out. Maybe early next week, Monday, Tuesday. But if there's no signs coming in by Wednesday or Thursday next week, I think we should be getting a little bit concerned. Not overly concerned because I think if Leeds can hang on to the players that they have at the moment, with the odd one or two, but if you know Harrison's injured, Adams is injured, City's playing, if they can hang on to those three, I think all of a sudden that team would look a lot, a lot stronger. But and you can just go out and get one central midfielder before the league the league starts, and you're okay. He did mention about the window going until the end of August. So that's going to be a thing as well. So obviously they're plan- he's planning on, you know, maybe a patient approach to this and, and having a look at, good look at the squad and then maybe making a move later in the window. We don't know who Leeds targets really are. We've heard about Nat Phillips and, and, and um, Hamer linked. Hamer looks like he's going to Burnley. Nat Phillips, there's still rumours that it could be done by Friday or it could be early next week. I'm not I'm not so convinced yet of it. I think it could be, it could be next week before we see somebody come in. And I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't Nat Phillips, if it was somebody else. There's talk of a German goalkeeper today as well, maybe um, coming in as a goalkeeper. That's an area that Leeds will need to sort out because Klassen's a half-decent shot stopper, but he's not great with his feet and he makes mistakes. Van de Heuvel, I think, is a better goalkeeper than him, but he made a pretty big mistake for the first goal, the ball going under his body, which was, which was pretty poor. So Leeds need, 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 need an experienced goalkeeper. The guy they've been linked with is a 27-year-old. I can't think of his name off the top of my head. I literally just saw before we started doing this, but um, that needs to be sorted. But I think Farke... We have learned an awful lot. I keep saying this every time we talk about a manager. We've had so many managers this year in the last 12 months that we keep going yeah. through the whole kind of, yeah, he'll learn enough from these players because, you know, we've seen them in action now. But I think he will. I think he will learn from this an awful lot more from this. And I think then, then he'll probably have an idea of what he wants to bring in. But I would, I'm would, i surprised that something hasn't happened yet. Mm. I think that I think it was managing expectations yeah. a little bit, saying kind of playing. It. I think he's also used to that. Might be you're correct. Like the way he's towing the company line, um, because at Nor at Norwich he had no resources. Right? I mean, what their yeah. their biggest signing was uh, eight million dollars or something like that. Eight million uh, pounds. So. Um, Josh Sargent, you know, so, uh, so he might just be automatically in front of the camera wired to, uh, temper expectations. I am, I believe this window is about who we can keep more than who we're bringing in just because when I've seen, you know, championship squads, uh, and just some of the stuff I'm reading, it's really difficult to throw the baby out with the bathwater in terms of the players in the squad. I, I think you do have to hold on to a core. I'm not saying that's the old guard, quote unquote, Bill Ailing, um, you know, Cooper, Bamford, et cetera. I'm not saying you have to hold on to them. I'm saying that whatever you, whoever you're identifying, 
uh, as players to build a, a squad around. We have to uh, we have to hold on to them for for dear lives. Um, let me ask you this question. Sure. You can only buy three three positions. You can only upgrade three positions. Right. What positions are you uh, are you upgrading? What player profiles are you looking for? Left back as a priority. Yep. Um, I'm somebody who can defend 1v1. That's that's the, the, the big one for me with that position. Mm-hmm. Goalkeeper obviously needs it. I'd like experience there. Um, somebody who not necessarily has just played championship level, but has also played Premier League as well. I think we saw it with Joel Rollwells last year. It's a safe pair of hands. A bit of experience in there goes a long way. Number nine... Yep. You're looking for somebody who's who can score you 20 goals a season, looking for an active, busy striker. There's not a huge amount of them out there. Burton Diaz would have been the perfect position for that. I think he would have suited the system really well, but he's obviously got the Villa, mm-hmm. Villarreal. Um, and then I think you're probably still looking for a number 10. I think we've never really replaced Pablo. And to be fair, we probably hadn't replaced McAllister <laughs> until we got Pablo. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 these are all very specific, specialized positions that we're looking for, and they're not easy positions to fill. Trying to find a 20 goal a season striker for a decent amount of money when everybody else is doing exactly the same thing, and there's not that many of them out there, is tricky. And then you look at the left back position, obviously it was Ryan Manning we were linked with. He goes to Southampton, gets a better deal there, and um, has a relationship with Russell Martin, so you can understand that move. Then you've got uh, Charlie Taylor, who's been linked, obviously there's, there's a history there with Charlie Taylor, positive and negative, um, but would be a player who knows the division quite well, would be an experienced head at this point in this, so he could be okay. But I still think you need to go and buy a second one if you buy Charlie Taylor because Leeds don't have any cover there. So I still think there's, there's, there's issues there. Um, and the centre of the park, we need somebody in the middle of the park with experience. So, you know, obviously Adam Forshaw was, was offered an extended deal on limited terms or a new deal on limited terms. Uh, and so far has opted not to take up the offer, not to come back to preseason training. Although that could change next week if he hasn't got any other offers. So they're they're tricky positions, but they're important positions. You're looking at a whole new spine for me: centre back, goalkeeper, centre back, centre mid, ten goal and striker, and then mm. sticking a left back on the side of that as well. But I think right back we're, we're more than covered. Wings, I think we're okay if we can hang on to what we have. And we have to wait and see with the other ones. But they're, they're for me the, the ones we have to get right. We have to replace this, the spine of the team. We have to make it stronger. What about who are the three or four players or, you know, maybe more that you really want to hold on to that you, that you think is feasible to hold on to and you really want to hold on to? It's just, again, it's a, it's a strange one because it depends on a lot of factors. It depends on players fitness. It depends on money, it depends on clauses. For me, I think, Tyler Adams would be a massive keep if we could keep him. I think they should mm-hmm. do everything they can to keep him. I think the injury he has might be a godsend. It might actually keep him at Leeds a bit longer because, you know, if, if it is a, a hamstring tear and it's not fully healed and the rumours of him being out till um, September are, are, are true, then that bypasses the transfer window and I don't think many clubs will take a risk on a player with a, with a hamstring injury. Um, a serious of the ones he's had that gets kept out for quite a long time since the end of the season. So, um, that would be a huge one to keep. Sinistera, again, his injury history might actually help us because, again, you might not see teams wanting to spend a huge amount of money on a player who has the injury record that Sinistera has, which is quite extensive even before he came to Leeds. Um, you know, got seven or eight goals last season, but zero assists from a wing, in posi- a wing position and, and was injured for quite a lot of season in different spells. So you've got that as well. So Sinistera would be huge to keep hold of. And then Willie Nanto, I think, is an important one to keep hold of. I really don't think we will, but I think he's an important one to keep hold of. Just because when you get back to the Premier League, or if you get back to the Premier League, I think you're not going to be able to afford to buy a player with the potential that he has. I think keeping mm-hmm. hold of him is something that Leeds could do, could do, be very smart in doing for the long run as well as the short term as well. But also, I think he'd absolutely rip up the championship. But they'd be the three that I would definitely look to keep. Help me out. Um, and this is this is, might just be this is more of a a thing that I, I guess maybe I'm, I'm struggling to understand, or if I don't, I don't know, you know, and you, maybe you can help me sure. when it, when there is a mentality of, if the player doesn't want to be here, we have to find a way to move them. Hmm. Is there a way to keep a player here? To me, if the player doesn't want to be here and doesn't want to, perform and play on the pitch 
that's also hurting their career as well. And their, you know, uh, sell on values and values as they build. I mean, your, your, your window to play football is so small. Yeah. So if there's a player like Willie that wants to, uh, that wants to move on and, and he's probably at above the level of the championship. I think if I was a, a manager or an owner of a team, I that and believe that statement is true, but is there a way that he can stay at and also be happy as well? Hmm. It's a tricky one because the first thing is you don't want to have a player in the dressing room who doesn't want to be there because that can upset people. And if he's not playing as well, if he's in there with the team, that can cause mm-hmm. friction. It can, you know, comments can be in the dressing room and training places. So it can cause issues. Um, but I think Willie's age is, is might be in our favour because he's so young and because he wasn't supposed to come in until this season. So he wouldn't have had the Premier League exposure he actually had. Oh, had Leeds not messed up the Cody Gakpo and, and, and the Bamba Ding situation happened. Mm. So it's, um, I think you try and convince him that it's one season. I think you try and convince him that you're going to try and invest and try and build a team around him and then push him in, and, and, you know, you're back in the Premier League next season. You're, you're not even 20 and you're back in the Premier League. So you, you haven't lost a huge amount. Italy are going through a, re, a revamp anyway, a, a rebuild. So you're not he, losing a huge amount on the international stage either. The World Cup and the European Championship is still a year or so, like two years, three years away. So you've got time to come down, play the league and the championship, get back to the Premier League. And if it doesn't work and you try and convince him, the same thing that they did with Calvin Phillips, stick with mm. us for another year. And if, it, right. if we don't get back to the Premier League, then we'll, we will agree to sell you to the club you want to go to. And that's what you, that's the only way to do it, I think. Yeah. Calvin Phillips still was to uh, Villa. Villa was interested in him and he was I, very, he is and might still be very close to Jack Grealish. Obviously, they're both Man City. Um, mm. so yeah, it worked out for all parties involved there. Um, Pascal, uh, yeah. do you have any hope? Do you have any hope? Uh, just in the hint, uh, Twitter, uh, there's nothing really verified, but before I jumped on with you, it looked like Twitter was kind of giving their respects to Pascal, thinking that he was maybe moving on. I, I, I didn't look like any really reliable source that I could find. Um, mm. Do you think there's a player still in there? I don't know. And that's that's being honest. I mean, all the talk about Stroke when he came in was the you know, next version of he, 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 Big sexy he pirate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As, as a square ball call of the big sexy pirate. Yeah. yeah. He uh, did he lose his power like Samson? I don't think so. I think it was because right. if you look at if you look at last season, um when the pressure came on at the relegation, his form dipped. And I thought he started last season really well at left back. Actually, there's people saying that we broke him by playing him left back. And my take on it is he's arguably played his best games for us at left back. First half of the season, at first, at least first third of the season, he was um very doing very well at left back. His stats were suggesting he was probably one of the better left backs in the league. His his, his dual wins, his possession keeping, his possession stats, his passing accuracy, all of that Jared, was encouraging. Do you, Jared, do you remember that game that he had against uh, Cardiff and Jesse gave him the armband? Mm. That way, he shriveled there. He did, yeah. Yeah, and I thought he was, I, he looked broken since then. Well, I understand what Jesse was trying to do. I've, I, I've, I've done that as a manager as well. I've, I've put captain's armbands on people at certain times. You know, I've got, you've got your club captain, your vice captain, but every now and then you'll just say to them, look, I'm putting the brand on this guy for today because of the following reasons. And your, your skippers are usually okay with that. It works sometimes, um, but I have seen it not work. Um, I had a manager when I was a player. I remember t- saying to one of my managers, you know, keep changing the captain every year and I'm sitting here looking looking at you and I would be honoured to wear the captain's armband and I'd love it. <laughs> and his exact response to me was, I can't give you the captain's armband, Jer, because if I give it to you, you'll spend the whole game worrying about everybody else's game and not about your game. And I need you to play your mm. game. So I was like, right, okay, mm. fine. Now I had a manager later on career who did give me the captain's armband and it didn't it didn't negatively affect me but it was a, I was a more seasoned player at that stage with a much um, older head on my shoulders so it can do two things it can empower people it can really lift give them a big lift which I think Jesse was to his credit was trying to do but if you're not a big character it can weigh very very heavily on you I, I did it with a guy once at a club I took over a reserve team and we had a, a really good under 18 team that were breaking into the senior setup 
And I decided to build the team around the youth players. I thought, right, we'll do this for a couple of years. We'll bring the youth guys in now. We'll keep the momentum going. We'll, we'll put a few experienced players around them. But I'm giving the captain's armband for the season to one of the young players coming in. He will be the club captain for the year. Just making a statement here that we're going to build for the future. And I said to him the first game I gave it to him in a preseason friendly, I pulled him aside and I gave him the armband. And I said, just to let you know, if at any point you feel that this is distracting you from your game, mm. isn't helping you develop, then you tell me and we take it away. And it's not a negative. It's just part of your development. If you don't like it, if you don't feel comfortable with it, let me know. We'll take it away. And he said, fine, no problem. He never came to me. Never asked to take it off. He was in captain for the season. He was excellent for me all year round. So you can go in two different directions. They can they can buckle or they can step up. And it's um, I think Jesse did it with all the best reasons in the world to try and help him get his confidence back. But it, I think because of how that game went and, and how he, he performed in that game, I think it might have had more damage. He's in that age bracket as well, where you're like, he's got ages ahead of him. He hasn't reached his peak yet. You've got time with him. But I think even short term, maybe you send him out on loan for a year. And let him mm-hmm. just go away and play football and try and clear his head. And then maybe you can bring him back then with a, with a stronger season under his belt. But I, I I saw enough yesterday in the Manchester United game to say it's the, he, he's still doing the same things. Like he reads the game very well and can cut out passes, but then his touch is always too heavy and he, he causes his own problems sometimes. So um, I feel sorry for the, for, for the guy because I think there is a, a decent centre-back in there. But the last two relegation seasons have really taken their toll on him. Mm. Yeah, he was a uh, success story for the club. Was, yeah. It's one of the reasons maybe Jesse gave it to him in the cup game against Cardiff and um, obviously we had to come back and um, uh, not, not Greenwood. Uh, who who uh, got the equalizer in that game? I can't. Um, he was a youth one Perkins. Perkins. Perkins, I believe, or maybe in the following game. Yeah, it was Perkins. Uh, he did score in the, he scored in the sec. Maybe it was the first one. Maybe he got the equalizer and then the second one. I think Perkins did score. Yeah. Um, what are your uh, early this season? Are are you are you hoping top six um, automatic? Are you saying you know we've got to get uh, one of the auto the, the top two automatic uh, promotions? What are you what are you hoping for? What are your expectations? Depends on the window, well, probably, but it really does. It really really does. Yeah. Yeah. But in saying that, you've got to have some idea of what you're planning. And it, they're all saying the same thing. Everyone keeps saying, bounce back to the Premier League, get back to the Premier League. And that's whatever way we do it, that's the most important thing is to get back into the Premier Division, you know, for the club, for for the future and the investment that we've currently got. We need to, that needs to happen. I think at the start of the season, the ideal scenario every summer is you get your signings done and dusted early and you have them in for the first week of preseason so they can come in and hit the ground running and, you know, get going. We haven't done that, and we've been guilty of that in the past. When we've been in the championship and we've been in League One, we've, we've left signings very, very late. And that then it takes time for those players to gel into the system. It takes them gel time to gel with each other because you could you put three or four brand new players in there who haven't played together before, and that's going to take some time. You want to get that out of the way in preseason. So when you don't do that, you, you're kind of putting yourself in a situation where it's a must not lose scenario for the first couple of weeks of the season, and just you know try and pick up some points. We don't have the hardest opening. I mean, Cardiff have got a transfer embargo. They can't sign anybody for any fees. They can sign free players, but not anybody for a fee, which is why they're trying to try and sign um, Ramsey. And look, that will happen, but it has to be a free transfer. That's a good sign for them in the championship. But we need to yeah, do the teams around us there in that, sorry, in that first month. It's not the most difficult first month of, of games, but if you've got a strong side going into that, it's a very winnable month and you can put yourself in a very strong position to dictate the tempo for the rest of the season. Listen to Daniel Farkas saying, you know, we have to make sure we just don't drop any points between the first month and August. And that that would said to me, I don't think he is going to have this squad in place for the end by the end of the window that he thinks he's going to have. I think he 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 looking at they may have to do some business in the final day already. Mm-hmm. So, and again, it could just be that he's man- managing expectations. But um, yeah, it's not. It's look, it's, it's not an ideal situation to be in. But I think Leeds need to start the season with a with a reasonably good performance against Cardiff and hopefully a win, and then just try to lose any games and. More importantly, not throw anything away or give away the same kind of goals we've given away in the past because that will yeah. just that'll just trigger everybody back to where they were last season pretty quickly. And, and we need a couple of performances where we can try to forget about last season. And that that's the key for me. But I think Leeds have to get promoted next year. I think if they don't get promoted next year, it could be it could be a couple of years before we get back out of this Ooh. division because the investment will drop the following year. And that, that's that's a problem. Let's uh, last couple of questions. EFL takeover rules changed. Uh, mm-hmm. There was an article, I believe, uh, at the Athletic. Phil Hay was a part of it. Uh, yeah. uh, author on it. 
uh, what was your take on that article? And then uh, article about the, or uh, question on the 49ers. But w- what do you think about the uh, takeover rules changing uh, this year and, and that article that came out? Well, there's been two changes, which is interesting because it's the first year leads go back into the EFL and it's nearly like a welcome back, lads, because they've come straight out with two things that have seemed to be directed at Leeds and there is one one of the changes that they did this year I, I, I'm calling it the Massimo Cellino rule and that's basically if you've been, if you've been disqualified you, you're not allowed on a club the end of story so that was the there was a 30 day disqualification when he was in the club and then he could come back he came back in and he was still the owner of the club again so they, they've they've moved to remove that completely Um, and then they, they changed the the other rules they added in a lot more specific individual stuff like any kind of criminal um, convictions against you as an individual, not related right. to business, but as an individual, you look at the amount of people involved in the Leeds United Consortium. You think if any of them have a criminal record, any of them you know, got picked up by the police at any point in their younger years, this could go against them. So mm. that was an interesting one that, that I thought. But then again, at the time, Phil Hay and everyone said nobody expects any problems here. You know, that's okay. And then you look at the change yesterday, and this is around fines. So if you announce a takeover publicly, and then right. you use this subject to EFL rat- ratification, you'll be fined by the EFL. So you're now no longer allowed to announce a takeover until the EFL ratify it. So we're all going to have to just sit in our tents outside the um, FA headquarters and, and just wait for the EFL to get their finger out and actually get them get a move on with the takeovers. Birmingham has got done today. Still waiting on our one to be, be announced. It was supposed to take days. It's now taken over a month and we're still waiting. So um, it's interesting the timing of the EFL's changes to the rules, but apparently the second one won't affect Leeds because it comes into effect in July and Leeds takeover was announced in June. So we shouldn't be hit with a fine. But as somebody said earlier on, the EFL will find a way. Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> that would just be uh, just funny uh, how they, so like in our case, like, you know, uh, Spieth, coming off the, you know, 18 and being asked about Leeds, Leeds United ownership. I don't know what he was, you know, where he was at. He was at some sort of golf event and did a very mm. candid interview with, with Sky and basically said, and then it's all done. Uh, would we be fined for that? Like, you know, who knows? Um, yeah. But yeah, hopefully all this stuff happens after this summer. And, um, you know, I, my suspicion is that they're just, they're trying to keep, you know, be guardians of the game Obviously, if you were to start to audit the Premier League and their ownership, would 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 everything be the same there? Well, probably not. But um, hey, uh, that's what they're doing. They are, um, you know, they are a very, I guess, you know, they're a thorough organization. I think that, um, yeah. Well, I guess that's all I'll say about them. But speed um, speed doesn't seem to be their forte. That's that's the one thing I think they 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 they, they like to be. A hundred percent sure of everything before they do anything, and I think in in football, soccer specifically, there's an element where I think they may have to gamble a little bit at times. And I don't know if they're that way inclined. They have been in the background that leads for a long time. They haven't been decision makers. People keep saying, you know, they've been around Rads. They 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 facilitated the decisions that he made, and they didn't have decision making powers until now. So that's an important um, piece to put into that. But they need to, maybe they're looking at the, the transfers that were done before and they saw a rushed manner and they didn't like the rushed manner. So now they're determined not to, you know, make, make the mistakes of the past. The issue with that is, is they might miss out on people because other people will move quickly and will take gambles. So there's a learning curve there from that side of things. And Nick Hammond should be the one that's organizing things. Phil Hay said something the other day about there was no leads, don't have anybody lined up currently in terms of players. And I thought that was an unusual statement. And, I, and again, I thought that can't be true because Nick Hammond's been in the job for over a month at this stage. Mm-hmm. His job was to be a transfer consultant rather mm-hmm. than a technical director for, for this, this window. So if he's been in for a month and Leeds haven't got anybody lined up, what's he been doing for a month? So I, I don't, I don't believe that necessarily. I don't believe that either. No, but I think the 49ers, the issue they have is they clearly like doing things in, in silence and getting on with their job. And I'm okay with that. As long as things are moving and things are happening. When it comes to players, nothing is happening in terms of incomes. Now, uh, Josh McDonald signed today and Louis Perry signed today. Now, Josh McDonald will, will go into the under-18 team, I think, into the, into the academy. Uh, Louis Perry will be an under-21 player next season. So, But they're not senior signings. But at least there's two signings have come in. And maybe that's the start that we can see because Josh McDonald's mother put something on Twitter where she said, it's finally official, which means this has been... I, I think I did a news story about this about 
uh, two weeks ago maybe that it was done and dusted and should mm. be done. It was two weeks ago. It's only been announced tonight. So mm. maybe there is stuff going on and maybe we will see over the next couple of days we'll start seeing players getting announced as they come in. But they, um, I get that they like to do things a certain way, but if they're not going to do things quickly, then they need to give some inf- indications of what's going on in the club. I, yeah, and I think th- things were slow before the 49ers took over. You know, like I, I was like any kind of transfer seemed to take. Like I always felt like it got it would break uh, by some somewhat uh, official mm. uh, accounts, like uh, like a Romano, and then it would take a few days before it was kind of announced by the club. Um, and I don't know if that's social media just taking a long time or I, I don't know. It, it just seems. They need to be quicker about it for sure, because uh, speed is is a factor in in getting some of these signings over the board. But then you worry as a fan, it's like, is this thing being hijacked? Uh, could it be hijacked? We haven't. We've been silent for a couple of days after this uh, transfer could come in. So, on the 49ers, because of the EFL and the ratification, do you? And for me, I don't want to taint your. This, your 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 answer here, but do you need to see Parag uh, in front of the camera once this is all signed, sealed, and delivered? Do you want to see him in front of the media? Are you okay yeah. with him kind of being behind the scenes? I'm okay with being behind the scenes, but I think the initial when it's done and mm-hmm. dusted, I, I've heard Parag talk before, and I and I like the way Parag uh, positions things, and, and I keep using the same word, logical. He's a very, very structured way about talking about things and very easy to understand. Um, He's a numbers of... guy. He's a numbers data nerd yeah. guy. Yeah. yeah. yeah, and, and that's okay. That's great. I like that about him. Um, and again, I keep saying they're making logical decisions. They're doing the right things the right way. Um, so I'd like to see just maybe the first press conference and then maybe he moves out of the way and the director of football, whoever that's going to be, steps in. If it's Lee Dykes who comes in, which would be a very good director of football appointment by a lot of, by all accounts be a huge one to get a Premier League director of football to come down to the championship so if they can Prague come out tell us what's happened give us the detail welcome to the club get the photo show, shoot done and then you know back into the background and, and let the director of football and the manager be the, to be the front of the club because we've had enough of owners um, in the spotlight right yeah I, I just when he took when when the 49ers Enterprises took a minority stake we saw interviews several interviews by parag Hmm. um maybe the course of like 12 months or you know 24 months there's just their archive you can see him that he's on men and blazers at least Hmm. here in the united states he's on uh the two robbies podcast he's on um you know a couple of maybe uh bbc radio leads interviews and they were well, they were, they were done really well. He, he interviewed really well. And so I wanted, I do want to see him. It doesn't have to be a press conference. It could be maybe a one-on-one with um, TV. Uh, but I do want to see that kind of formal, just takeover uh, thing coming from Leeds United it just would make me feel like you can, we're officially turning the page. Um, so Hopefully that comes. Are you getting the uh, Are you getting the green uh, quarter zip from the shop? Have I you got it. I got the. I bought the vests. This the sleeveless blue and green one, just because summer and gym. Um, <laughs> the only reason I bought them because you can't get them over here. So I thought well, I grabbed them before they go out of stock. Um, I'm looking at waiting until the sponsors are added to to the training wear over the next couple of weeks. So I think the okay. first batch of stuff that comes in, I think the sponsorship was was sorted out after the first kind of batch of everything was done same with the jerseys no flamingo land or amt logos in the back so i'm kind of gonna hang on till the end of the month have a look at it but i think mm-hmm. yeah i'll 100 be getting the green stuff but uh, somebody said to me will we see you wearing the green on the stream a stream and i said probably not because i've got a green screen so i'll just the middle of me will just disappear um and nice then, there, uh, the whole, that looks really nice alex even the, the kit's uh, beautiful beautiful yeah i like the home kit it'll be great to see the the uh away kit being released yeah, have you seen that leaked? Haven't seen it leaked, but I, I I saw, I did see a mock-up of it a while ago, and if it's if it's what I saw, I think it's pretty much safe to say it on this. The, the guy that 
Tommy won't be listening to this podcast probably. So <laughs> I hope not. Um, basically, it's a navy jersey with the peacock design that's in it, and it has green and navy kind of green and purpley kind of flex on the peacock feathers oh. design. And it's it's very different, but it's really nice. And it would be a jersey that would be very different to everyone else in the league. Now, I saw it with a couple, so there hadn't been a decision made on it. You know, the, 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 I was told the fruit salad one, the yellow and the yellow and orange thing that was leaked last year isn't one of the shirts, but I I think it might end up being somewhere. I, think I always think we play well. We play well in a, in a dark away. Uh, oh, the black one we yeah, had was my we, favorite. The all black kit black, was my favorite one we had. A black one, the the, the dark gray and pink. pink one, yeah. uh, the um. The bus the, stop. Obviously, the the, <laughs> the bus, the bus yeah. cover one, the blue with the navy blue with the yellow and white stripes on it. Yep. Yep, and then the the, the two in the in the, where we finished ninth was like a burgundy, a dark burgundy, and then a dark uh, navy and green. The green uh, and navy the, was it was a throwback to a kit yeah. that we used to wear in the past, Tony Abola wore, and I loved that color scheme. And I was yeah. like, I'd be really happy if that became Leeds alternative strip. Like, so you've got all white, blue, and yellow, and maybe every second season, one season, the second gear is blue and yellow or blue, and then the third, the next season, it's it's navy and green, and then the third strip can be you know play around with that a little bit and try some things out with that but uh um we're getting bespoke stuff this year which we, we haven't got with adidas we've pretty much got stock um stock print oh, from adidas yeah. for the last couple of years and the designs mm-hmm. we got were the same as other clubs designs just different colors of it this year we've actually got a different one i think the, the company was called acid that that designed it Rajrazani tried to take credit yes. for the design of it but acid are actually the company <laughs> who designed it they're local they're a local bunch of lads i think as well and mm-hmm. um, who got involved and did that so um yeah he can't take credit for that but it's, a, it's an absolutely stunning kit the training gear is lovely as well i'm not so sold on the mint green with the dark green i like the dark green but the mint is a bit weird but I think they've done a good job this year so far. I'm ex- and I'm really excited to see the away strip because if it is what, I, what I've seen, I'm really excited to get my hands on it. This was a small thing, but I like that the the socks, uh, striping on the socks, match the striping on the shoulders. I don't know. It just looks classy. I'm, um, I'm an old school with the socks, mate. I like the um, – I wish Leeds would bring back the tassels on the socks or at least the print that has. <laughs> it looks like a tassel on the sock. I, just growing up as a kid, my dad used to wax lyrical about this – tassel that Leeds had in the 70s on their socks and I was like what is he talking about and I started, I started showing me pictures of it and I was like it's just a nice classy look and touch that nobody else had and I like Leeds having things that nobody else has it keeps them unique and one of the things that uh, Daniel Farkas said when he took over Leeds job was Leeds is a special club and we've got to do everything we can to make sure it stays unique and stays special and I like that and I think there's little touches Leeds can do at times now they did it they brought it back in the in the noughties around it wasn't the Champions League year, maybe just before that, where they had like a print on the sock that looked like a tassel. Um, but it was nice. It was really nice. But they didn't they think they the United off the socks this year. So it just says Leeds on the socks this year, where it usually says Leeds United. Mm-hmm. Interesting mm-hmm. Uh Jir, good talking to you, my friend. Thank you, mate. Um Always. please follow I Jir Lynch. If you're not following Jir, I don't know what you're doing. His uh <laughs> daily show is called uh, Leeds United The View. It's got daily curated Leeds United content. If something is not 100% verified or if it's not, you know, if it's a complete rumor mill, he'll tell you this where the source and where, is it, where, it, where it's coming from and if you should take it with a pinch of salt. Um, so appreciate what you're doing and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Cheers, mate. Thanks. All right. Cheers. All right.